In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. There's a silent epidemic running rampant throughout the world. Without an accurate diagnosis, we can only point the finger at what we can test and observe. This epidemic is responsible for all sorts of sickness, evil, injury, paralysis, tyranny, and even death. It is pervasive from top to bottom. This epidemic affects every man, woman, and child and every aspect of life. No one is exempt from its effects, though most deny its very existence. We live in a constant state of fear, anxious and terrified that today might be the day that we finally succumb. But of course, rather than credit the real cause, the world has all manner of diagnoses to explain the pain and suffering that is felt by everyone. Evil from others, well, that just has its source in mental illness. Sickness is due to poor hygiene or risky behavior or chemical pollutants. Paralysis is due to neglect or poor safety standards. Bad government is just the result of elections. The world is inherently good, we think, but it just needs a little bit of work. More treatments, more scientific advance, more medical devices, more therapy, better candidates. We're in a perennial race for the cure, enslaved to a panicked desperation to finally get everything back to normal when we were healthy and well again. But was that ever really the case? Today's gospel gives us the real diagnosis, the real situation. We meet a man who is truly suffering. And there's nothing, just like us, there's nothing he can do about it. The paralytic could not move his legs. He couldn't stand, he couldn't walk, and he couldn't work. But of course, Jesus reveals that his suffering is really under an even greater paralysis. The man is being held by the epidemic of sin. The Bible calls our corrupt nature, that enslaving force, sin. Everyone born in this world is infected by it. And the Bible also calls, thus, the sinner, the one infected by sin, by other names. Or in our epistle today, the old self. Or elsewhere, the old Adam. And again elsewhere, the flesh. Everyone is born not to run, but is actually born already dying. So let's be clear and define our terms. Our thoughts, words, and deeds are fruits of this corrupt nature, sin. Usually when we say sins, plural, we're talking about the symptoms of our nature, this disease. The symptoms that are manifest in what we say, what we think, and what we do, all of which are contrary to God's word. Thus, the old self, the sinner, is responsible for every deceitful desire, all falsehood, all anger, all theft, as Paul reminded us. And as we learn in Genesis, the sin of Adam brought this sinful nature, this corruption, not only to us, but actually to all creation. With sin came sorrow, came toil, sickness, and finally, for everyone, death, even for this world. Therefore, the word that Jesus spoke is the best word that he could possibly have heard. Jesus says to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. This is not Jesus ignoring this man's physical paralysis. Jesus is giving the man the cure for his disease forever, the root cause. Forgiveness from Jesus is not 
is actually the immediate and complete removal of everything sinful. Forgiveness is restoration, unlike anything that your doctors or your pharmaceuticals or your therapists could ever give. Forgiveness in Jesus is the removal of Adam's sin and everything that comes with it, all of its fruits. So because Jesus has forgiven the paralytic, this man lying on a bed has the promise of a full and complete restoration, not only of his sin-sick soul, but of his paralyzed body and the resurrection of the dead on the last day. His sins forgiven, he gets to go down to his home justified, even if it is to be carried on his bed by his friends, awaiting the day of resurrection, the day of that healing promised. Now, the old man sinner scoffs at the absurdity of any of this, these words of Jesus. Even in our text today, it's the churchmen who think Jesus is a blasphemer by forgiving. The world laughs in mockery at our emphasis, overemphasis, they would think, of the forgiveness of sins. None of them, whether it's the old man, sinner, the churchmen, or even the world, none of them want anything to do with Jesus and his gifts. And even today, many have and will continue to mock you, you the faithful, for having such a singular focus on being and receiving Christ's forgiveness. They may even say of you, this man is blaspheming. If Jesus really cared for the man, he would have taken care of his body first, and then care for his soul later. These are those who refuse to listen to Jesus, who refuse to believe and often seek to hinder others from trusting in this forgiveness of sins received from top to bottom every week in the divine service. Sometimes the opposition is just a mild skepticism. What good can come from Nazareth, from another guru, another man, wise as he may be? Other times the opposition to Jesus is proud hatred. This man eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners. And sometimes it's the prototypical world that's in league with the deceiver to draw you away from Christ and from his forgiveness. None of these want you to trust and have your faith in Jesus and his shed blood for the forgiveness of your sins. And by doing so, there's an even worse effect. The world, by drawing you away from Christ's forgiveness, is actually disconnecting your earthly life from the life given to you by the Spirit in your baptism. That's the world's temptation is to drive a wedge between your body and your soul, a wedge between faith in Christ for his forgiveness and the earthly life lived in the body and lived out in vocation. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or rise, take up your bed, and walk? The answer is both are impossible for us to say. They can only be given, received as a gift from Jesus. Unlike Jesus with that paralytic where his forgiveness and then his restoration to life are absolutely intertwined, you've been indoctrinated to think that faith is just a private matter, just between you and God. And that the only thing that matters is actually your life, your body, and what you do with it, what you put on and what you eat, what you drink, and how you preserve it on your own. But that's not Christianity. That's not a faith that keeps earth and heaven connected, like Jesus does, calling each human to be and to act in faith, living each day in the forgiveness of sins, living Christ's forgiveness with Christ's forgiveness in every vocation, at home and at work and in this world. So were it not for the founding of an apostolic church by Christ himself, there would actually be no remedy for that epidemic of sin, no Christian faith today, and therefore 
no means to address the cause of all of our misery and struggle. Or to say it briefly, without Christ establishing his church, there'd be no forgiveness for you. It's actually by way of forgiveness that the Bible says the Christian is given to struggle with the world. Because the world is the battlefield where we struggle against Christ's enemies. Enemies who are absolutely opposed to Christ and his cross and the forgiveness given there. And so the world's attempt to draw you away from Christ is to give you this ungodly confidence that you can actually resolve all of your issues yourself. It's the highest pride of man to think he could ever overcome the enemies of the Lord. That's the realm of unbelief, and it's the inspiration of the old man. We too can become like God. But there is only one way to win, and only one man who can win the prize. We need true faith that overcomes the world. We need a victor king. And we need him to grant us the spoils of that victory. And there's only one way to finally overcome the epidemic of sin and win the victory. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And Jesus who overcomes by dying for the forgiveness of your sins. The only thing necessary is faith. And how does Jesus give such faith? It's not through the blessings of this life. It's not simply through just giving you healing. But it's, those are actually gifts of healing and the things of this life are God's good and gracious will. But they're gifts that are given to everyone. They don't give faith. As Jesus says, it rains on the just and unjust alike, even this morning. Instead, saying to the paralytic, rise, take up your bed, and go home, well, that might give him some sort of confidence, but it's only a temporary and fleeting faith until the next catastrophe or until, finally, he would face death. Jesus doesn't begin with rise and take up your bed and walk, go home. Instead, he speaks the words that gives faith, true and lasting faith, faith given by the gospel that will save the paralytic and you into eternity. It's only faith given through Christ's forgiveness that finally silences the accusations of the old man, the flesh, and the accusations of this world and its temptations, temptations repeated from the father of all temptation, the devil. Faith comes through the forgiveness of sins. And this faith is unconquerable because it's bound to Christ himself who has already conquered, the one who has already overcome the world. Mere earthly healing could never give such faith. Only faith bound to the cross of Christ and his forgiveness, won through his atoning sacrifice, only that faith will have the victory. And where there is this forgiveness, there always follows life and salvation. Maybe now, but for sure later. For where there is forgiveness in Jesus, we have the promise, just like with that paralytic, of a full restoration of our body and soul and life eternal with God. That's the only way we can face the epidemic of sin. That's the accurate diagnosis. And that's the way by which we can suffer in the flesh with hope. Living in the forgiveness of sins, that gives us the assurance that no matter what we suffer in this life, whether it be temptation, trials, addiction, shame, sickness, tyranny, even death, whatever we have to suffer, we can suffer with a sure and confident hope that sin and death have already been overcome. And we have the victory. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus. Amen.